the uh, or we'll just run with it. So, uh, good evening. Uh, as Bob said, I'm Mike Quino, and I am an archaeologist with Grand Pape, based here in Houston. We also have offices in Richmond, Cincinnati, uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, but I've spent most of my career with Grand Pape here in Houston. Uh, so we do a lot of work in Texas, mostly locally, but all over the Gulf Coast. And today, I am going to be talking about. Camp Logan, which was located right here in Houston and is formerly what was now Memorial Park here in Houston. If you're anyone local to Houston, should have a pretty good idea of where Memorial Park is and its role in the city. Uh, first, I'm going to start with any good presentation with some caveats. Uh, I am going to necessarily give you a sort of abbreviated history of Camp Logan so we can get to the archaeology part because while I can and sometimes do talk about Camp Logan for hours and hours on end, we don't have that sort of time here this evening. So if you're interested in getting a lot more detail about the history of Camp Logan, uh, just so happens that there are a couple of really good books out available from uh, Louis Albach, Linda Gorski, and Robbie Morin. You can find them on Amazon and a lot of local bookstores. And if you want to learn more about just the background history of Camp Logan, you should really check those out. Um, and there's gonna be some other things that I'll kind of breeze over just so we can get to the archeology span and have plenty of time for questions to wrap up at the end of the evening. So when the United States entered World War I on 6th of January, 1917, it had a standing army numbering about 133,000 soldiers. And most of those soldiers were actually in the US colonial possessions like the Philippines. So they weren't even readily available to be shipped over to Europe to fight in the war. Just to provide you some context, the French army had lost 160,000 soldiers just in one battle at uh, the first Verdun earlier that year. So the U.S. Army was wildly undersized to actually be able to contribute on the scale that was happening in Europe at this time of the war. Uh, the quote at the top, one million men by next May, is from the overall leading American general during the First World War, General Pershing. And this is what his report back to D.C. was when he got to Europe in the summer of 1917, that the U.S. was going to need at least a million troops by the following May. To build up that manpower, the United States established 32 training camps across the United States. Um, each camp was designed to support up to 40,000 soldiers. And roughly, they designed these that each camp would build a division worth of uh, men. And you can see in the map here that I've got up on the screen, the two different types of camps that they built. Uh, the open circles are National Guard training camps. Those were mostly located in the South. And that's because the Army's thinking was that National Guard troops would require less training and would be cycled through much more quickly than draftees and enlisted men win. So they could go to the South, enjoy the, our nice temperate weather that we have here in the South, and they wouldn't need to build permanent structures like they would at the National Army camps, which are the solid dots. Uh, those camps had more intensive structures. They had actual barracks buildings and the things like that. Uh, Houston was selected to be a National Guard training center, and it was named Camp Logan because a lot of Illinois soldiers were coming here, and uh, General Logan was a relatively well-known Civil War soldier. Uh, construction began 25th of July, 1917, and completed on the 18th of August, 1917. So extreme rapid construction. Though you will notice that I have put completed in quotation marks here, because in reality, the Army never stopped building at Camp Logan. They kept adding things almost right up until the day they shut the camp down, because when you rush a job, there's always things that you discover you missed and you probably should have added later. We're going to get into some of those things that uh, you know they had to put together on the fly. 
The full opening of the camp was delayed by the August 23rd, 1917 Houston riot or Houston mutiny. Um, this was a uh, altercation that ultimately happened due to the U.S. Army bringing a all African-American unit to guard Camp Logan during construction. And those soldiers interactions with what was an extremely segregated city of Houston at the time. Uh, they ran and had several conflicts with the local police. Um, there was arrests. Several soldiers ultimately tried to march on downtown. There was exchange of gunfire, several losses of life. Uh, many of the troops were eventually discharged, tried with murder. Um, this is another thing that I'd love to talk to you about more, but for the sake of speed, we're going to move along here. If you want to learn more about the mutiny, there's some great resources. Ask me after, and I can help fill you in on you know where you can learn some more about uh, that episode in Houston's history. The initial troops, like I said, came from the Illinois National Guard. Those troops were what they called federalized at that time, which means they were basically whole hawk turned into U.S. Army soldiers, and they became the U.S. 33rd Division. Illinois also had a segregated regiment of African-American soldiers in their National Guard, the Illinois 8th. Those soldiers were converted into the 370th Infantry, which was a subdivision of the 93rd Division, which was an all African-American division. So when we talk about Camp Logan, I've outlined the footprint of the main camp on a modern historic aerial here for you. You can kind of see where the camp was located in modern Houston. And you'll notice that most of the camp is what now is Memorial Park, with the exception of some areas kind of north of I-10, running along the north side there, and the uh, residential communities of Camp Logan Edition and Rice Military, which sort of run along the east side of the former camp. But if we went back to 1915, before Camp Logan was built, you'll see that what we're dealing with was the outskirts of the city of Houston. Camp Logan wasn't built in the middle of nowhere. Um, they wanted the ease of access to city of Houston utilities, but they also needed an area that was built on the outskirts of the city so that they had the land they needed to uh, build a training camp. But there was more than just the core camp. They had a rifle range and a artillery range built well west of the city. The artillery range is out heading towards Attic's Reservoir. And basically soldiers would rotate out for a week or two weeks at a time to do specialized training at the rifle range or the artillery range. There are also drill grounds, basically north and south of the main camp. Uh, so areas where like I-10 is now and parts north, as well as areas of what's now the River Oaks subdivision. These were used as drill grounds for soldiers during the training process. Now, Camp Logan itself had sort of a triangle shape. The image you see here is actually from the U.S. Army's completion report, which is basically a report that was produced after the camp construction had wrapped up, detailing different elements of that construction and how the camp was laid out, as well as sort of a critique of what worked and what didn't. And you can kind of see in this plan that Camp Logan has a triangle shape, which is sort of unusual for these camps. I've looked at some of the others. They usually were laid out in a straight line or sort of a square, you know, army efficiency. Um, I think they went with the triangle here because they were hemmed in in part because the railroad ran along the north and northeast side along with Washington Avenue. They were hemmed in by the bayou along the south. And then there was another spur railroad line that ran along the west of the camp. And a triangle was kind of the best that they could do to lay it out. The sort of tail located on the left-hand side that's the remount depot. That's where all of the horses and the mules were uh, organized and mostly kept. Keep in mind, this is a transition army. We have not gone fully motorized yet. So the army still ran as much on horsepower as it did any sort of motor power. Uh, to kind of put you in terms of where you would be in reality, the far right, the eastern side of camp, that's where all the administrative and hospital buildings were, those structures are now mostly in residential areas now. So they're not, they don't overlap too much with modern Memorial Park. So we haven't been able to do a lot of archeology span in those areas. But running along the south and the west side, 
that is mostly the areas where the men were encamped. And that's where we've been able to do a lot of our archeology span because that's all located within Memorial Park and it hasn't been as heavily built up. So keep in mind, I talked about the National Guard camps were built to be temporary and they were built to be fast. They were mostly tent cities and this was by design. Uh, I've zoomed in here on a specific block. Each one of the blocks in Camp Logan was roughly designed to house a regiment of soldiers. And all the enlisted men and all the officers stayed in tents. And you can see some images of these tents. Uh, during most of the camp, they were not full canvas tents. They had half wood sides and they had wood floors. Um, they very quickly decided that just pitching canvas tents on the bare ground probably wasn't good in the long term. So they made these sort of half wooden structures with canvas tops and canvas sides. If we want to walk through how one of these regimental blocks was organized, you notice at the top of the image, some long linear rectangles. Those are stables. That's where the men would have kept the horses or mules that they were actively using at the time. Moving forward, you would add a line of shower buildings. And then in front of those were uh, lavatories and latrines. The bulk of the block that you see there was occupied completely by tents. And you can get an idea of just how many and how compact the arrangement of tents was in the uh, National Archives images that you see here. They were spaced pretty close together. Each tent would have had typically about eight men in each tent, but it could be as many as 10 if needed. In front of the tent encampment area, those other long linear uh, buildings that you see there, those were the mess halls. And then moving downwards from those, divided by the road there, was an area set aside for officers. Officers had their own tents. They didn't have to share as deeply as the enlisted men, just one or two officers per tent. And then the officers had their own mess halls and their own lavatory and shower buildings. And those kind of rec lone rectangulars in the very bottom of the image. You also see scattered around the images some of the other buildings. These were mostly recreation buildings, YMCA, Knights of Columbus, as well as storehouses. Uh, so there were thousands of buildings within Camp Logan, but the bulk of the camp was designed to house tents for men. So let's talk about these mess halls because they are by far the most common wooden structure that you would have seen at Camp Logan. They were wooden structures, but they did not have wooden floors. They were again, built cheap and built quick. Uh, that oversight led to some issues as you see from this quote, analyzing uh, how the structures worked in the completion report. Either it was so muddy and wet that the earth floors and the mess halls were often underwater, or it was so dry, dusty, that the tramping of many men through the mess halls to their proper places covered the waiting food with a blanket of dust. So appetizing. Uh, the men generally, when you read letters, the nice things about the food and the amount of food that they got, but it's very obvious that the actual dining halls themselves probably left a lot to be uh, desired. And we're going to talk about some of the consequences in terms of what we look at the archaeology of uh, this design of the mess halls. Now, there were some very more heavily structured buildings, like actual wood frame buildings with wood floors and real windows and everything. But oddly enough, at least within the main part of uh, Camp Logan, these buildings were typically for uh, recreation and entertainment. Uh, the images you see here are from the inside of the camp library. Uh, reading was a big deal and people were donating books from all over the country. The library was staffed by uh, actual librarians who volunteered their time to come and serve at these camps. Uh, you also see the color postcard is a YMCA building. There were at least a half a dozen of these buildings scattered around the camp so that men had easy access to those types of buildings. And then uh, the image on the bottom there is actually a view of the Liberty Theater. And men could go and see various types of shows at uh, the Liberty Theater. And that was located in what's now actually the southern end of the golf course in Memorial Park, along one of these big ravines. Uh, and the idea behind all of this entertainment and recreation 
was basically to keep men out of trouble. There had been a whole lot of national hand wringing after the Spanish American War and after the intervention in Mexico that the men had too much free time on their hands and they were getting into trouble. And we're also at the height of the progressive movement in the United States, very moralistic, uh, we can build better people uh, ideas were very prominent. And you see that in this quote from the Secretary of War Baker, I am determined that our new training camps, as well as the surrounding zones within an effective radius, shall not be places of temptation and peril. You can practically hear the Baptist preacher coming out of him right there. Um, and you'll notice the zone element of it. These rules that they instilled at the camps didn't just apply to the camps. By U.S. Army fiat, you could not sell alcohol within three miles of a training camp. So if you happen to own a uh, saloon or a liquor store somewhere in the city of Houston and you were unfortunate enough to be within three miles of Camp Logan, tough. The army was going to write you a check and tell you to move your business elsewhere or to just close up shop. Uh, it's probably important to note that within a year of the end of the war, the United States is going to fully enter prohibition. Uh, we're going to become a dry country. And Texas is actually going to pass its own state uh, prohibition law while the camp's opening in 1919. Of course, you know, it wasn't all fun in games and scene shows. A main part of what the soldiers were here to do was learn how to be soldiers and learn how to fight on the Western Front in Europe. And a lot of that was at the outlying areas that we talked about, the rifle range, uh, the drill grounds, and uh, the artillery range. But they also need to prepare for trench warfare, something that a lot of them probably had no experience for, including a lot of the officers in the U.S. Army at the time. And so they dug pretty extensive networks and trenches. The largest set you can kind of see outlined in purple on this 1944 aerial were built northwest of the camp. This is north of kind of where I Interstate 10 runs. And a lot of it is sort of this junction of I-10 and uh, 610. This was a long network of trenches that were uh, built in part on the advice of French and British uh, officers who came over to advise on what the realities of trench warfare were like. But there were other trenches that were built closer to the heart of the camp. And you can see some of those smaller uh, trenches outlined also in purple, including a set that's now uh, within the golf course. And it wasn't just trenches, the uh, demolitions uh, units also buried uh, dynamite and blew up giant craters so that the men could get the experience of scrambling in and out of craters just like they would if they were on the Western Front and were dealing with artillery craters. Now, the war actually ended in March of 19, or in November of 1918. And once that happened, training units at Camp Logan began to be drawn down. Uh, one of the things I most commonly asked is why Camp Logan was closed. You know, why don't we still have a Fort Logan uh, on the outskirts of Houston, just like you know, San Antonio has an army base on its margins. Uh, there's a few reasons. One, the army itself was always pretty upfront that these training camps were meant to be temporary. They built them to be temporary. They told anyone that asked that they were going to be temporary. Uh, however, politicians and community boosters constantly had out, held out hope that their camp was going to be the exception to the rule and was going to become a permanent, you know, U.S. Army cash cow for the community. And Camp Logan did have a chance to be, uh, have an extended life. Uh, the U.S. Army was still concerned. It was only a few years earlier that the Army had gone chasing after Pancho Villa in Mexico. Mexico was still in the middle of a very chaotic revolution. And the army thought that there was a good chance they might have to intervene in Mexico again. And so they wanted to keep other bases uh, near that they could dispatch troops from to Mexico. And they considered Houston and Camp Logan. But you can see a sort of critique here by the Brigadier General Little Brown of his analysis of Camp Logan and Houston. Drainage poor, terrain low, nearly level, hard pan close to the surface. Mosquitoes always present, 
flies, numerous and troublesome. A lack of diversified train, hot, humid, and unstable climate, poor drainage, presence of marshes, less than the value of Camp Logan for troop training. Now, I feel like any of us who have lived in Houston for any length of time, we're going to be sort of insulted by that description, but then we're immediately going to go, well, yeah, okay, that's fair. Uh, and it didn't help Camp Logan and Houston that the camp and city that they were competing against for this position was Camp Kearney in San Diego. And, you know, I love Houston, but Houston weather is really not going to compete against, you know, sunny, beautiful San Diego. And so we lost to San Diego and Camp Logan was decommissioned. And I found this image uh, in the National Archives and you can kind of get a feel for what Camp Logan looked like anytime it rained hard. And again, I don't feel that any of us that have spent a lot of time in Houston are gonna be particularly surprised that, you know, there was a drainage problem at Camp Logan. But Camp Logan's closing did open up other opportunities. In 1924, it was purchased by the city of Houston, sold very cheaply by the Hogg family to be converted into Memorial Park, which is gonna be Houston's centerpiece sort of wild nature park on what was then the outskirts of town, but was going to you know really help bring up Houston's image. Unfortunately, uh, when you look in the late 1920s and early 1930s and you read descriptions of former Camp Logan and Memorial Park, the complaints are generally that the city hadn't spent any money to do park upkeep. The roads and bridges were all the ones that the army had built. They had washed out. You couldn't get around the park. You couldn't get from one side to the other. Uh, it was a favorite place for various criminal activities. Uh, lots of complaints about people shooting uh, cows and horses in Memorial Park and leaving them there. Uh, there was a stolen plane left in Memorial Park once. Um, just a whole host of things that, you know, an area on the outskirts of town uh, that isn't necessarily seeing a lot of resources is going to deal with. Then the, Repu Repu uh, then the Depression comes along and the park enters a new phase. Uh, there were Hoovervilles, which if you're not familiar, Hoovervilles were uh, homeless encampments that sprung up all over the United States uh, during the Depression. And so uh, homeless people were building uh, little shantytown homes uh, and living spaces in Memorial Park because it was available space. They could get easy access to the bayou um, and make a, a go at living here in Houston. Then uh, once uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes president and starts this alphabet soup of organizations, including the Works Progress Administration, money starts becoming available to do these sorts of projects. And a whole host of money and thousands of uh, hours of manpower went into first the Memorial Park Golf Course and then the park as a whole. And it's really during this period in the 1930s into the 1940s during the depression that you get Memorial Park as we're sort of familiar with it today. Picnic Loop, Memorial Loop Drive, Memorial Drive, all of these things really come in to the forefront during this period. Camp Logan never really got forgotten. People tended to remember that the Memorial and Memorial Park was in honor of Camp Logan and the soldiers of First World War, though it wouldn't necessarily be common knowledge. And you can pretty much be guaranteed when you look at the archives every 10, 20 years, the Houston Chronicle would trot out a story about, you know, do you remember Camp Logan and uh, Camp Logan's association with Memorial Park? Now, while the connection between Camp Logan and Memorial Park was always, you know, at least somewhat remembered in Houston, the actual physical remains of Camp Logan really kind of just completely drop off the radar. Nobody talks about them in the old articles. And this really doesn't change until you get to 1989. And in 1989, uh, more archaeology, a local CRM company, did a large survey of Memorial Park, and they recorded a lot of the structural features that we're going to talk about tonight. And they also, at that point, is when Memorial Park was officially designated an archaeological site. Uh, not after that, it became a state antiquities landmark in 2013. And then the other group that honestly helped drive this idea that there are remains of Camp Logan in Memorial Park and that they're important is the HAS and Louis Albach. 
who did walking tours and talked to the press about the importance of the ruins, drove reporters out into the woods so they could see the different foundations and things like that, and helped you know ensure that you know the people in and around Houston appreciated the archaeological elements that they had. So for a long time, we'd just done several smaller projects, and then we had the more archaeology project. And that was the basis of everything that we knew about archaeology at Camp Logan, right up until 2015. And in 2015, the master plan, as they call it, for Memorial Park was developed and approved by the city of Houston. And this was really a response to a combination of things. Uh, Hurricane Ike and a prolonged drought in 2011 did really damage the tree canopy. And after that, uh, invasive species have really taken over. The underbrush was and has continued to be up until recently pretty bad. Um, and no one had really done any sort of updating in Memorial Park since the Great Depression and those WPA projects. Uh, and so this was a way to help, you know, update Memorial Park and, you know, rehabilitate a lot of the, uh, the overall environment. And since it was going to cover the entire park, it meant that there was an opportunity to do a lot of wide scale archaeology for the first time, looking at every area of the park. And that's where I come in. In 2016, I did my first archaeological survey in Memorial Park, and it's been nonstop that ever since. I actually just finished my most recent survey a few weeks ago. So let's look at the numbers for our archaeological work at uh, Memorial Park. We've excavated about 1,300 civil tests. We've identified at least eight additional archaeological sites that aren't Camp Logan running everywhere from the late archaic up until the 1950s. Uh, we have recorded and mapped at least 102 Camp Logan features. We've excavated over a thousand metal detector hits. We've got seven, seven gigabytes of research sitting on my hard drive at home. And we've produced 10 archaeological reports and Oh, one master's thesis, which is in progress, and hopefully I'll have that finished there. So if you're like me and you just read all those numbers, you're tired and you're ready to crash out in Iraq. This is literally one of my all-time favorite Camp Logan photos, courtesy of the World War I Museum in Kansas City. So what did we get with all that archaeology? Well, we're going to start by talking about the concrete and brick remains. These are the things that if you've ever gone walking around in Memorial Park, especially if you've ever wandered slightly off the beaten path, you may have seen on the ground or looming out. Maybe it was just a concrete footing wall. Maybe it was a manhole. Maybe it was a whole wall. And you kind of wondered what that is. Well, our job has been to clear these off, record them, map them, figure out what they are and, you know, what sort of overall function they served within the camp. Oddly enough, most of the features are all connected to addressing one critical shortcoming. When the army built the camp, they built it to run with open ditches and pit latrines. So shower water just ran into open ditches and those ditches all eventually ran into Buffalo Bayou. That's miles and miles of ditches that required constant upkeep. Uh, the impenetrable soils, the slow draining soils that we have here in uh, the greater Houston area, meant the pit latrines didn't just naturally seep away. Uh, so their first solution was to pump them out with basically giant vacuum cleaners and haul the waste away and dump in city of Houston sewers. sewers. They also had to constantly move the latrines. And that led to this lovely quote here, again, from the Camp Logan completion report about how they had to move the latrines so many times that they were running out of places to put them. And they kept having to put them closer and closer to who, uh, where the men were actually living in their tents. And anyone who's done a lot of camping knows the worst campsite that you can get is the camp next to the latrine. Uh, you can also see in this image here of a latrine at the end of its life, that the more they move these structures, the sadder and sadder they started to look. So the solution was finally, the army accepted that they needed to put in an actual sewer system, sanitary sewer system at Camp Logan. So part of that was building shower buildings and lavatories that were fully plumbed with concrete floors. And if you run across these low concrete footing walls out at Memorial Park, these are either a lavatory or a shower building. And you can see what a brand spanking new uh, lavatory looked like here in the National Archives image, as well as the inside with full modern plumbing. 
And it's important to think, remember that for a lot of these soldiers, particularly if they were from rural areas, this may be the first time in their life that they had regular access to full, regularly plumbed indoor plumbing. They may have come from a rural community that just that wasn't an option. Uh, the Army actually ended up putting these in 16 of the 21 blocks. Uh, some of the blocks didn't get these features, and I haven't found the actual paper trail for it, but I suspect that's because the Army already realized that the camp had already probably reached its peak occupation, and they weren't going to need all those areas going forward. For the kitchens, they had originally just burned off all of the uh, wastewater. They had giant uh, pans and you just dumped all the liquid into these pans and fired a uh, little uh, brick incinerators underneath. And you just boiled off all of the liquid waste. Uh, they used so much wood that it actually covered the entire cost of the sewer system within the first year of the camp. Uh, so again, it's short-sighted on the Army's part, but they got there eventually. And so they built these grease traps. And initially what you see is when you find these is what's kind of up in the upper left there. Uh, they're just rectangular, two-chambered brick or concrete uh, structures. They look pretty unassuming. During the construction of the land bridge, which you've, if you've gone through Memorial Park recently, you know that they've got this new giant land bridge uh, that connects the north and the south sides of the park. Uh, that required realigning Memorial Drive. When they did that, uh, one of these grease traps was going to have to be uh, in, removed because of the new road alignment. So we fully excavated one of these. Um, we put a unit in the interior and then we used a backhoe and fully excavated the exterior. And we were pretty shocked at just how massive these things are. This thing is about 10 feet deep. Um, and when we started digging into it, it would have had capacity for well over 1,600 gallons. And each one could have served 2,500 individuals. So there's essentially one of these for each regimental block. And all of the kitchen water waste from that entire regimental block flew, flowed through one of these grease traps. And you can see in the, ex the unit excavation photo, there's a really nice layer, stratigraphic layers there. The stuff at the very bottom, the stuff that was more than two meters down, uh, it literally smelled like fat still. Like it was greasy to the touch, it had an odor and stuck to everything. Um, so that was almost certainly the last Camp Logan deposits down at the bottom of these things. Above that was a bit of a fill layer. And then there was a gap when we had a demolition layer. And these things originally had a brick coursework on the top of the concrete. And at some point, probably during the park period, because we found some artifacts from like the 50s mixed in with this layer, they pushed all that brickwork into the pit um, to make them flush with the ground and probably less obtrusive. And then still later with artifacts that we found mostly dating to the 60s and 70s based on the number of pull tabs that we found, uh, the park probably completely infilled this particular example just because it was a safety hazard. You don't want a giant three foot hole just standing around in a active park zone for people to go falling in. Everything through this system then was connected to these manholes. There was a hundred, there were 193. They're brick sort of honeycomb shaped structures and then coated in waterproof cement. You can see in the example that we completely excavated here, it's got two pipes coming in on either side. This funneled water in this case from two officer showers. And then it ran out the pipe kind of coming towards you on the screen. And that fed into a main trunk sewer line that carried all of the water away. Very, very rarely, we find these manholes with a manhole cover. And you probably cannot quite pick it out on the image, but the inner ring on this manhole cover says property of the USA. And that's our number one way that we identify, you know, city of Houston manholes from Camp Logan. We've actually only found two of these. And I suspect that the main reason is that this was some pretty valuable salvage, either during the original camp period or during any number of other periods where someone may have just wanted to recycle a really heavy piece of iron. The whole system was connected by thousands and thousands of feet of new piping. In total, it comes out to be about 23.5 miles of new pipe that in part was installed using actual modern, at the time, 
heavy equipment, uh, backhoes and trenching machines. Though the completion report does note that uh, compact Houston clay was in many cases too much for the machines to handle and they broke down and they still had to fall back on just digging by hand in many, many cases. The end point for everything was a settling tank and a pump house. This is actually located in the southeast part of Memorial Park behind uh, the maintenance buildings for Houston Parks and Memorial Park Conservancy. And it would go into the settling tank. Any solids that were still around would settle out into the bottom of the tank. Then it would go into the pump house and it was actually pumped across Buffalo Bayou and ran through a new pipe to a city of Houston uh, manhole and then ran into the city of Houston sewer system. Now the city of Houston sewer system actually was relatively recent. And what we're seeing here is like a sort of admirable uh, step to stop dumping just literally everything into Buffalo Bayou. Uh, Houston had only recently stopped doing it. And with this new system, the army also made a commitment to like not just running all of their waste into the bayou that then runs right through the heart of the city. Now, it's not all sewer systems and wastewater. Uh, we also did some excavations in the ballparks. And if you remember, uh, you've been around Houston a while, the, a lot of the ball fields used to be south of Memorial Drive. And during the recent Houston renovation, they moved everything to the north side. And that area is now actually a large uh, prairie wetland. We knew that the ball fields had been partially built on fill. So we brought in a backhoe to pull some of that fill away and get a look at what was underneath. And we found this very interesting feature in one of our trenches. There's obviously a construction trench, and then there's sort of a circular shaped stain, uh, a few bits of iron wire, and we weren't 100% sure what to make of it. We started looking at our maps, we started doing some historical research, and then we went back and we put in a full excavation unit. And it turns out what we had actually found was a section of wooden water line. And what you have during World War I is sort of the last heyday of the wooden water pipe. They have a long history of the United States, um, but this was sort of their last round. And they mostly were uh, useful to groups like the Army because during World War I, uh, resource restrictions meant that iron and clay uh, were needed exclusively for the war effort and the wood could be more easily gotten. And this is actually, these pipes were built from wed redwood, brought in from California. They assembled it into sections and then the whole sections were held together by intense wire banding. And when we excavated our hand unit, uh, we came down on this. All that's left was the iron wire, badly corroded. All the wood was gone. And then the whole interior of this was filled with this really silty, silky sediment that had filled up within the pipe when they were went out of use. And you can see an image of how these pipes were installed actually from a different camp in uh, Georgia. They just dug the trench, laid them in, in sealed everything tight, filled it in, and you just ran water through them. Now, it's not all just structural elements. We got, we have found some elements of daily life. This is some examples of the uniform material that we found. Uh, the image at the top is a collar disc, and then the image below that is actually a U.S. Army uniform button. I've shown you an example here from a World War I soldier of where those were on the uniform. The collar disc is actually pretty interesting because it has Ultimately, if you can make out through all the intricate scroll work there, USNG, so US National Guard. And during the early days of World War I, there were three different types of collar discs, one for the National Guard, one for the Standing Army, and one for the new draftees and enlisted soldiers that were referred to as the National Army. Didn't take long for the Army brass to figure out that separating everybody out into different categories was one needlessly complicated, and two, it encouraged these different groups to sort of look at each other as not all on the same team. So before the war was out, this all just became the standard U.S. that you're probably used to seeing on uh, Army uniforms, and this sort of intricate uh, scroll design was uh, went out of favor. We found other things. This is a cap to either a tube for uh, shaving cream or tooth cream, as it was called at that time. It's from the Colgate Company. Uh, and we found this in an area, not surprisingly, leading between the encampment area and where the uh, 
lavatories and the sinks were all located. So probably just something that somebody dropped off their toothpaste tube moving between uh, their tent and, you know, the showers and whatnot. And a lot of people are surprised that, you know, dental care was actually a thing for the army during this period. There were dentists at Camp Logan and, you know, proper dental hygiene was stressed by the army. This became an even bigger deal during World War II. But what you see in this early 20th century is, you know, taking care of your teeth for your health and not strictly for cosmetic purposes. We also found an ink bottle uh, for a fountain ink pen. And remember I said that a lot of the emphasis was on keeping people out of trouble. One of the ways that it was thought that you could keep soldiers out of trouble was telling them to write letters home and write letters often. Uh, so soldiers could go to places like the YMCA, get paper, pens, uh, stamps, and write letters home. And they were basically encouraged if they weren't doing anything, you should be writing a letter home and telling your family how important everything is going and that they should buy war bonds and, you know, just encourage the general war effort. So why do we find so few personal artifacts directly related to Camp Logan? There's a lot of reasons. You know, some of it is that there's a lot of metal detecting that went on in the past by uh, amateur collectors, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, but another reason is the army is really clean. Uh, I, there's this great image here, and you can literally see they're sweeping dirt. They take no care for the dear archaeologist who's going to come along later. They're picking up all their trash and making it go away. So if we want to find personal items, what we really need is to find where the trash went. And that leads us to the Houston Arboretum Project, which I know some of you were a part of. And basically, the Arboretum, which is located west of Memorial Park and was not technically part of Camp Logan, they eventually, they recently dug into what turned out to be a sort of illicit trash pit. And in that trash, there was a lot of, you know, civilian trash, but there was also some things that were definitively Camp Logan, like the identity disc you see there. And so the Houston Archaeological Society called me in to come help out, and we screened a lot of this material and got a good selection of artifacts. Unfortunately, we did this in late 2019. Uh, we came back from holiday break in 2020, and we started hearing about this COVID thing. And next thing you know, our project is wrapping up much earlier than we originally uh, planned. But we've got a lot of stuff, and eventually uh, I'm going to get some HAS folks together to help uh, do some of the final artifact analysis. Finally, I'm going to end tonight talking about identity discs in general and how they kind of help encourage us to tell personal stories of soldiers. So the identity disc as a sort of standard issue item was originally suggested for the Union Army in the 1862, but they didn't go through with it. Now, soldiers all throughout history have come up with different ways to like identify themselves. So if they die on the battlefield, people will be able to identify and figure out who they are. But standard issue uh, identification uh, didn't come about until 1876, 1878, and as identified begun by the German army. Other national armies started to follow suit, including the U.S. Army in 1906. In 1916, the U.S. added the second dog tag, and so we're kind of familiar with the idea that, you know, you have two tags, one stays on the body, one gets taken so that you can confirm that uh, the individual had died. In February 1918, they added serial numbers as opposed to roster numbers. Uh, this is basically because the army had grown so large in size that roster numbers were no longer a practical way to keep track of soldiers. And then in July of 1918, the army issued a directive to remove all unit information. Only information on there was rank and name. And that's because they were concerned that the Germans would be able to, like, to, you know, gather intelligence from uh, looking at dog tags. Their first dog tag set was free. If you lost one, you had to pay two cents to get a, a replica. And they were made using kits like this, where basically all the letters were hand stamped into a tiny aluminum disc. And since this was done sort of ad hoc on a company, a regimental level, you get a lot of variation in what each disc looked like because individual uh, sergeants may have done those discs differently. So the only true archeologically recovered in a primary context, CISC we had belonged to Bernard Walmer, Private First Class, Company M, 129th Infantry. And 
conveniently, we found his dog tag near one of those mess halls. And we know from other historical resources that we actually found him in an area of camp that was assigned to his specific company. So it's almost certain that he lost this dog tag going to or from his mess hall one day. And when you think about that description of all the dirt and the mud and whatnot that accumulated in a mess hall, it's very easy for you to imagine how you could drop that off and you would never find it ever again. Uh, the image on the upper left is actually the tag for conservation. These are very thin sheets of aluminum. We sent it to the A&M Conservation Lab up in College Station. And they did a great job of cleaning it without damaging it any further so you can make out some of the more information. Bernard was from Wisconsin. He was born 12 April, 1898. He was the second youngest of 10 siblings, big farm family. Uh, he left school after eighth grade to go back work on the family farm along with the rest of his brothers. And he enlisted in September of 1917 at the age of 19. Now this is mostly notable because when the uh, enlistment and draft rules were first established, they only applied to those 21 and up, which means that when he enlisted, he went out of his way. He didn't have to enlist at that point. Now, one of the reasons, and we don't know this for sure, that he may have felt the need to do so is that as the son of a German immigrant, he may have felt extra pressure due to anti-German feelings that were pretty prevalent in the United States. You can see a clip here from elsewhere in Wisconsin where a farmer was basically charged with a crime for just saying something nice about the Kaiser. So a lot of German immigrants and first generation Germans in the United States felt extra pressure to really contribute to the poor effort because of these feelings. Bernard served in some of the most extreme campaigns in the United States during World War I, including a pretty prolonged gas attack during the Moose Offensive. And there were 380 casualties in his infantry regiment due just to the gas attack. Uh, and this, a lot of this had to do with the sort of poor quality gas masks that the U.S. used. They didn't necessarily take all the advice of their European uh, partners. And soldiers weren't always trained on how to use their gas masks, certainly not over a long period of time. Uh, after the armistice, he served in the occupation army for an extended period of time before finally being discharged in June of 1919. He was promoted to corporal at some point. So he apparently was a very good soldier. And then he came back to the United States, went back to Wisconsin, spent the rest of his life living in Southern Wisconsin, married Dolly Adele. I found a photo, it's probably an engagement photo of Dolly and Bernard. And he got a job working in mechanic and car dealerships. Uh, they never had any children, but he did raise dogs. I found a photo in a newspaper of Bernard with one of the dogs that he, he raised, sport dogs. And he died in December of 1976 and is buried in Southern Wisconsin. The tag that we found at the Arboretum to kick that whole project off belonged to Walter William O'Connell. Walter is from Chicago, was born in 1890. He was the only child of William and Molly O'Connell, which is a way of saying that Walter was super Irish. Following his father's death at a relatively young age, his mother took on boarders and essentially just ran a boarding house. Uh, he first worked as a stenographer, but when his draft card in 1917 states that he was working at the Western Electric Company, which is in West Chicago. Now, this is important because when he got to Camp Logan after enlisting, he became enrolled in the Field Signal Company, and he used equipment manufactured by the Western Electric Company. So it's almost certain that when he got to Camp Logan, someone found out that he had some familiarity with this newfangled electronic equipment, and he was drafted into the Signal Corps. Interestingly, I actually found Walter's grandmother through Ancestry.com, and she had some of his old paperwork, and it suggested that he was actually discharged from Camp Logan. So it's possible he may never have even actually went over to Europe, but stayed at Camp Logan to train other soldiers on how to use field signal equipment. He went back to Chicago, lived the rest of his life there. His house is still standing. Uh, he seems to have hit some pretty hard times during the Great Depression. He went from a $30,000 home to a $3,000 home, and he got a lot of in-laws moving in with him during that time. And the last we find him, he's working with the Works Progress Administration, again, helping soldiers learn electronics, in this case, the Navy. We've got some other deaths that we turned up. One, as you can see, is almost illegible. It's going to go to A&M again. More recently, we learned about a disc that was found ages ago that is oddly 
dedicated to a uh, the National Guard unit this soldier was in and not to his army division. So this is something that he probably arrived at Camp Logan with. So why does Camp Logan matter? One, it's still a memorial and Memorial Park still fulfills that function of honoring the soldiers who trained and fought. Second, it's a key moment in early Houston. Houston explodes in size for the first time really after World War I and World War II. And finally, it's one of the last camps preserved to any degree. And there's a quote actually from the WPA officials doing the golf course talking about the fact that even then there were hardly any of these camps in any sort of preserved condition. Thank yous. First of all, thanks everyone for coming out this evening. Uh, thank you to the Memorial Park Conservancy who actually is really committed to doing this archeology span and being interested in our results. A lot of times I do pipeline projects and road projects. Nobody cares what I find. They just want me to record and move on. Memorial Park Conservancy has been great about being real stewards of the archeology. span Houston Arboretum and Nature Center, that project never would have happened without their cooperation. Houston Archaeological Society has always kicked in and helped out whenever they've been asked and have been really great resources. I constantly email members about different artifacts. Uh, all of my research, National Archives, Army Heritage, Houston Public Library, Rice University, University of Houston, the National World War I Museum, which is up in Kansas City, and the San Diego and Air and Space Museum, which actually has an odd collection of aerial images for Houston from this time. And then finally, the biggest thank you to uh, former members, uh, former presidents, Linda Gorski and Louis Albach. And if you know them, you know that they were deeply involved in the history of Camp Logan. And they really just, you know, whenever they found I was working there, grabbed on to me and basically never let me go. And every time I had a question or needed help, they stepped in and contributed their own research. Linda has shaken every tree possible anytime I've asked her to find someone who's an expert in some weird random thing, because she always knows somebody. Uh, and really, you know, the, the work that I've done in a lot of ways, you know, starts and ends with them. Thank you. I think I only ran shortly long. And questions. Oh man, did I answer everyone's question in my presentation? The, the firing area was located almost certainly directly off the railroad to like the Missouri KD Railroad. And then they probably fired north towards the reservoir. Right. And actually not too long ago, I had a conversation with someone who's responsible for uh, old military sites with the Corps of Engineers. We were just sharing information about a different project. And I did ask her and she said to her knowledge, no one has ever turned up any artillery shells from Camp Logan in that area. Probably, yeah. Probably the reason is that they excavated a whole lot of that area out to actually build the reservoir. But you know what? If you're walking in that area and you find something, you know, sort of, you know, shell shaped, just leave it alone. Can't go wrong. Yes. Yes, yeah, the uh, the question was about a uh, U.S. health service police badge uh, dating to World War II. Uh, and a lot of this comes back to the fact that Memorial Park didn't stop its military connection with Camp Logan. Uh, a lot of Texas National Guard units did demonstrations there in the interwar years. And then during World War II, there was a sizable military police contingent that actually was stationed in Memorial Park. Um, and soldiers on leave would sometimes just camp in Memorial Park during World War II. So like this, that connection between the military and Memorial Park really just ran right into the present day.
I am sure someone has, you know, cataloged it somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. That was an excellent presentation. There were some questions on Zoom. Does Mike have time for those or not? I didn't see any. Okay, shoot. Yeah. Okay, let me go through here. Most of them are mine, but okay, let's see here. Okay, have you seen and documented the bridge that Lewis is pictured sitting upon, and is it still there? So that to be a bridge. That's actually the questions for the filling tank and pump house that I talked about. Um, the it's, pump house? Yes. Okay, okay. Couldn't quite hear you if you could lean in a little more. And then um, Lewis, Lewis mentioned once that he had seen some vague impressions still left by trenches the men had dug, but I think he said they had gradually disappeared. Have you run across anything like that? We have not. I mean, there are hints of like road ditches and things like that still in some areas of the park, but in part because the old training trenches were in areas like along and within the golf course, they've just been manicured out of existence. Hmm. How many of the 193 manholes have you run across? Oh, I think we've got at this point. How many? 30 something. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff is gone because of uh, the various roads built. They got taken out or covered over. And there's probably still some out there that we've missed because since they flit, sit so flush to the ground and they're small, unless you step right up to it, you're you're really, really easy to miss. Okay. Does the Conservancy have a plan, to your knowledge, for a trail to, uh, we could, you know, the public could follow to these sites? Historical oh, of the features are now visible from the new trails that they've built. I know you can see at least uh, one or two of the grease traps. I know because I sat in on one of the planning meetings that they're going to actually putting up some signage soon at one of those grease traps. So it's a little more noticeable. And then uh, the Memorial Groves area on the far west side of Memorial Park is going to be sort of much more their uh, Camp Logan focused. And so I anticipate that whenever that design and uh, phase of the project goes in, there'll be a lot more focus on uh, Camp Logan in that area. Okay. And you had mentioned publishing 10 or more reports on your work there. Is that something we can access or is that only, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that quite respected? Public copies from the Texas Historical Commission uh, that have like sensitive information redacted from them. Um, and then I I think a few of those public copies have made their way online. If you just do a Google search for my name, they will come up. Uh, I know I've seen them a few times. Um, but the, yeah, the, the public copies are available to anyone who uh, wants to request one. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions unless there, there anyone has any more. Put them, put them in chat right now. Otherwise, uh, oh, Sarah, Sarah has a question. Okay, this is going to be the last question because we need to okay. get out. Sarah, do you want to unmute yourself or let me see if I see your question. Sure, I can do that. Okay. Apologies. Yeah. Sorry, I asked it in the beginning. I was just wondering, um, Mike, what, what your next steps are. Like, are you planning more survey and excavation? Are you <laughs> taking a well-deserved breather to get some other stuff wrapped up or wh where is this going next? Uh, we just finished some work in the Memorial Groves area because that's the next area that they're planning on incorporating uh, the master plan design in. And so once that design is complete, we'll make an assessment of what other archaeology needs to happen based on project impacts. Right. Um, but yeah, we've now surveyed the entire park at a pretty good level. And so now it's mostly just going to be going back as project demands require it. Um, and maybe eventually I'll have some time and I can write up a good summary of right all. And, you know, it. wrap up the permit, right? <laughs> and wrap up the permit. I've got many, many permits. Uh, I bet. <laughs> okay, I think we have to call it a day now. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Let's stop the uh, recording.